number this morning because of time constraints and uh, recognizing fathers as well as the baptism at the end of the morning service. And I have chosen uh, to bring the Father's Day message today, hopefully under the leadership of God Almighty, a father that is not very much spoken of in the Bible, a father that I frankly have never heard a Father's Day message on. You will perhaps remember that I did speak of this father a little bit more in detail back around Christmas time, and that should give you an idea of which father I am going to be speaking of today, and that is none other than the stepfather of Jesus Christ our Lord, Joseph. Now, of course, Mary was his mother, and uh, she is often talked about, but quite often uh, Joseph is uh, not spoken of. Quite often Joseph is almost in the forgotten background, as it were, and I have to believe that in the Lord Jesus coming into a home, there was not only the importance of the mother that was involved, but also the importance of the father. Now, I know that Joseph was not the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know that he was miraculously conceived because of the Holy Spirit of God Almighty. And obviously, God the Father would be the Father of our Lord. Now, even as I say that, I must hedge just a little bit in this vein. And you guys know I'm a stickler in this area. Uh, Jesus Christ did not begin at Bethlehem. He always was. The Bible tells us very clearly in John, John's Gospel, chapter number 1, in the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word already. That in the beginning may be cross-referenced with Genesis 1.1. When in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In John chapter number 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. That was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So I want to lay it out plain. Jesus Christ did not begin at Bethlehem. When the Bible speaks of his being the firstborn, it does not mean he was the first in order of sequence, it means he was the most important one ever came into the world. Obviously, you can see the reasoning behind that. However, we also, I think, are wise to look a little bit at Joseph, that home into which the Savior was born. To do so, I want to look both at Matthew and Luke just a little bit. So in Matthew, as we have already seen from our Christmas series, in verse number 18, we have of chapter 1, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then we have some information given about Joseph, and I think there are some wonderful traits that are going to be given in this passage as well as in the passage in Luke that are going to be quite helpful to men in our day to try to emulate, to try to pattern their lives after. 
uh, of course and obviously, we are to pattern our life after the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet in the Bible, there are men that we can certainly look to and, hey, you can do a whole lot worse than a lot of those men in the Bible. And I think that Joseph is one of those fellows. I know that somebody's going to say, well, Brother Burkholder, he's hardly ever mentioned in the scripture after the birth of Christ. Uh, in fact, the business is, the last time I know of his being mentioned is there in the uh, book of Luke where his mother and father had taken him up to the temple and having gone back, uh, suddenly they found out that the Lord Jesus was not with them at about 12 years of age, just thought, and they were looking for him. That's the last I know of anyway, that I can think of right now, of Joseph's being mentioned. There's very little given about him. Uh, that uh, has its good points, though. There's nothing really bad said about Joseph in the Bible. I don't think that would be the case if they were writing about me in the Bible. But we have many fine things said if we look for them about Joseph. And I realize, again, I want to state that I know that Joseph was just the stepfather of Jesus, but yet, while even as a baby, Jesus was God. And I know that presents various questions and various thoughts of which probably we won't get answered until we get to heaven and ask the Lord about it and the master teacher will unfold those precious jewels from his word to us. But I want to say this, that I feel that it would be all right to consider that there was an influence from Joseph through the characteristics of that man which we as fathers today could incorporate in our life and hopefully pass on to our children. Now I know that Joseph wasn't able to pass on to the Lord anything. I realize that. I hope I'm on now. I realize that Joseph couldn't pass on to the Lord. I mean, hey, he was God when the day he was born. In the womb, we know that he was God. He never became less than God. True, according to Philippians chapter number 2, he voluntarily veiled himself of the outward manifestation of deity. But he was never, ever, any less than God Almighty. So I know that, you know, there wasn't very much that Joseph could impart to the Lord Jesus. It's just the opposite, right? The Lord Jesus could have been the one doing the imparting. But for our sakes and purposes today, I want to look at some things in Joseph that I feel are very admirable. And in 19, verse 19 of Matthew chapter 1, we have then Joseph, her husband. Uh, I want to chase a rabbit just a moment. Uh, uh, when they were still in that espousal time, According to verse number 18, she was found with a child. But in verse number 19, it says, Then Joseph, her husband. And you have to understand a little bit about the Oriental versus the Occidental thought process. And in that area, that espousal time was very much like what we would call our time of marriage now. Uh, it was a little different. But uh, indeed, once that came about, he was considered, if I may so say, her husband, as is seen in verse number 19. Now, having said that, uh, 
Then Joseph, her husband, being, and the first thing that is said about him is that he was a just man. Can that be said about our fathers today? Can that be said about me? I think that Joseph was a man of his word. I used to hear my dad say there was a time when a man's word was as good as his signature. Anymore, it seems like neither his word nor his signature is any good. But there was a time, as I say, a man's word was as good as his signature. I think that Joseph was a just man. I think he tried to do right in his dealings. I don't think he was a perfect man. I think that Joseph was a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I think that Joseph had to be saved in a kind of bottom line analysis the same way we're saved today. In other words, it was the blood of Jesus Christ that atoned for Joseph's sins, the same as it is today. He was not a perfect man. He was a sinner. But I think he tried to live a life after the pattern of God Almighty. I mean, come on, let's be reasonable. The home into which the Savior was sent was a home that lived as best they knew how for God Almighty. Both Mary and Joseph were sinners. They both needed the salvation just like we need today. But I think they both tried to live for the Lord. Joseph was a just man. Now I want to say this also, that in that just, I basically have talked about the positional justness of Joseph. But I want to say this, that he was a just man. If he were a justified man, and that is kind of involved in this business here, he was a just man. And the only way to be justified is by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now I know that things were a little different back then before the cross of Calvary. Maybe I can kind of put it this way. They kind of looked forward to that permanent shed blood sacrifice at Calvary in Jesus Christ. But I want to say this, that he, I believe, would have been detailed as a saved man in this day that we live in. And so the two very first things I find out about Joseph is that I want to say I believe he was saved and he tried to live it. One guy told a friend of mine named of J.O. Grooms one time that he was saved but he hadn't been living it. J.O. Grooms had the good grace to say, maybe you ain't got it. Well, there is something to be said about that. By the way, I think a man can be saved and backslid. I believe that about Lot, as is detailed in 2 Peter chapter number 2. And which man here in the audience today who is saved would not say they've ever gotten backslidden in their life before? Praise God, we have 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the very first thing I find is that Joseph was a just man. And then I find something else about Joseph that tells me that he was a kind and compassionate and gracious man. Because the Bible goes on to say, not willing to make her a public example. During that espousal period, if uh, the potential uh, or husband found an impurity in his wife, uh, he could put her away, uh, according to Old Testament law, according to canon there. And, you know, sometimes, folks, you can do stuff that is right before the Lord, but you can do it in the wrong way. 
your spirit can be harsh and cruel. In fact, some Christians I know of can be kind of mean-spirited sometimes. But I find in Joseph something that I think men need to consider to incorporate into their lives today, and that is that he was not willing to make her a public example. I tell you, I got to tell you, that I think a lot of times we Christians like to point to somebody else in their failure because it makes us feel so much better. Well, now, that's a pharisaical attitude in a person. But I want to say this, that Joseph, to me, was the kind of guy you'd like to have had for a neighbor. He was the kind of guy you'd like to have gone to church with. Joseph was the kind of guy that you could have confidence in. He was not willing to make her a public example, example and was consequently minded to put her away privately. I think he was a merciful man. I think he was a man who could understand the other fellow's position. Now you say, well, yeah, sure, Brother Burkholder, because uh, uh, after all, this was uh, the wonderful incarnation of Jesus Christ. No much wonder he was like that. Yeah, but at that particular point, he didn't know that, right? At that particular point, all he knew is, is that uh, she was with child. So I think this speaks well of Joseph and I think a lot of men could use those characteristics in their lives. And then it is that while he was thinking about this and that's another thing I find about Joseph and how can I put this exactly? While he thought on those things, I don't think he was impulsive in his action. This business of while he thought on those things, to me, tells me that he was a man who tried to wait on the Lord. He was a man who tried to consult with the Lord. He was a man who prayed about things. To me, that phrase, while he thought on these things, is full of potential and full of many, many wonderful ideas that we could expound on in this day that we live in. He was not one to be quick on the trigger. He was not one to jump the gun while he thought on those things. I want to say this, that I believe that a lot of us would be wise before we open our mouths to go to the Lord and pray about it. Usually, it's our mouth that gets us into more trouble than anything else that I know of. Joseph, while he thought on these things... I call on God's men to do some thinking about stuff before you act. I call on God's men to do some praying about some things before you act. While he thought on these things, it was then that the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and told him what the case was. He realized what the case was and then he followed what the angel of the Lord told him to do. He followed God's advice. He thought on those things. He waited. He delayed. Which is one of the good tactics, I think, in a man's life. Don't be overly quick. Now, sometimes you don't need to pray about things. You don't need to pray uh, about whether or not God wants you to live right or things like that or tithe or go to church, whatever, when you can. But there are a lot of things we have to agonize in prayer over in our lives. And I believe that if we seek the Lord's will, the Lord will show it to us. And I base that on John 7, 17. He that will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Right? Isn't that what it says? 
But the trouble of it is, too many of us don't pause to listen to what God has to say until we blow it good and big. And after we've blown everything up, then we go back and want God to fix it up. Anybody like, don't raise your hand. What amazes me is that many times, now I'm going to tell on myself, you'll be thinking, yeah, you've blown the gun once in a while there, Brother Burkholder. I can tell that by your statement now. Uh, what amazes me is that many times God goes back and fixes it up after we've blown it. Boy, haven't we got a great Savior. We have a wonderful God Almighty, and I am so thankful for him. And i got to tell you, folks, that I think that Joseph, after he found out the will of God, I note that he did it. Now, that may not be a big thing to you at this point, because you know, well, yeah, sure, why shouldn't he, Brother Burkholder? The, uh, what some people might say, one of, at least one of the greatest events in history of time was coming about, and Joseph was going to be a part of it. Of course he would go ahead and do what the Lord wanted. Yeah, but you wait just a minute. This involved a great decision for Joseph because not everybody was going to believe that Jesus Christ was the virgin-born son of Mary. In fact, the Pharisees even said, we be not born of uh, fornication. Do you remember that one? And you got to realize that Joseph was making a decision that could potentially cause him a lot of heat. Boy, he could catch a lot of flack because of this decision that he made. But he did it because it was the will of God. Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Would to God Christians would do that. Would to God Christians had that attitude in this day that we live in. I'm going to do as God leads me no matter what the world thinks. Now uh, believe me, you, you live for God. You sincerely and genuinely try to walk with the Lord. And there will be plenty of Pharisees out there to come along with criticism. Everybody knows how you ought to live better than you do. And you'd think they know better than God knows. All I've got to say is, God help us. Study to do your own business. <laughs> you remember that one? And let us realize that even though Joseph was in a way of taking much flack, he still did what the Lord wanted him to do. I think that is commendable, and I call on God's men to do just that likewise. Because the Bible says, raised from sleep in verse number 24, he did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. And uh, I, I want us to notice something else. I must be very careful and tasteful in the choosing of my language now, so please pray for me. But uh, the Bible says in verse number 25, He knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son. I'd like to make uh, a couple of remarks on that, if I may. Uh, Joseph, again, was a man of understanding and a very compassionate man and a kind man. But this adds one more thing to my, my book. He was a disciplined man. Now you can take that and put your own devotional thoughts with it. But Joseph was a disciplined man. He knew her not. Now another thing I find in this verse, and again, some people won't make much of it, but I think it's wonderful myself, he called his name Jesus. Now, the angel of the Lord had said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, verse 21. And then in verse 25, And he, mind you, he, not Mary, but he called his name Jesus. Again, you've got to realize the Occidental versus the Oriental mindset and thought process in some of this. 
But quite often, a, a firstborn son, and I realize the difference. This was a unique birth. There has never been a birth like this before. There's never going to be another birth after it like this. I know the scientists are coming up with all their magic. All they're going to do is create a bunch of monsters, if you want my opinion, after this is all said and done. And we have one virgin birth in this world, and it's Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> so I realize all that, but I still want to say this. It would have been common in the, the time of Joseph to name the firstborn son especially in the vein of well the father or someone in the family name but he had been told thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sin and he called his name Jesus I realize it also says Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us, wonderful, 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 wonderful. But he called his name Jesus. He did again as the Lord told him to do. And there's a little something more to this than at least to me meets the eye here. You have to kind of dig and study and ponder and meditate on some of these things to get this. And some of you may agree and some of you may not agree. But uh, knowing a little bit about uh, manhood, uh, knowing a little bit about the male pride business and so on, uh, I, I think to myself, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from his sins. Do you realize that uh, in one way, uh, Joseph was being told he's going to be a better man than you? In one way, Joseph was going to be, was told, uh, uh, Joseph, uh, this, this son is, is going to be at the top. He is at the top right now. And Joseph, when you call his name Jesus, he shall save his people from their sin. That includes you and your sin. And I just like to say this. I think he had to have enough humility about him to accept that. And I believe that he did. And so I call on God's men today to be men of humility. There is much in the Bible on that. And then if I may, please turn quickly over to Luke chapter number 12. Uh, pardon me, chapter number 2. I want to bring a couple of things to our attention. In Luke chapter number 2, we have the story of the incarnation of Christ and Mary's genealogy given to us. And of course, now it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And uh, in verse number 3 says, all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And... Um, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea unto the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now, everybody likes to gripe about the government. Right? I mean, hey, it's the national pastime. I mean, it has supplied uh, baseball, uh, etc. And back in those days... I don't imagine people like paying taxes any more than they do in the day that we live in now. But I want you to know this. Joseph was compliant with the law. It was not a law that asked him to go against God's law. And in some ways, he may not have liked Caesar too much. In some ways, he may not have liked the Roman government too much. In fact, kind of the Jewish realm was known for that, if you know anything about Jewish history at all. But yet, I would like to say this, that he did comply with the law. And listen, 
it took more for him to comply with it than a lot of people because Mary was with child and had the baby at Bethlehem. I know somebody's going to say, well, sure, of course, Brother Burkholder, that's the way the Bible designed it. God had it all laid out from the beginning. I'm thankful for God's plan from the beginning. But now you put yourself in Mary's place and Joseph's place. Uh, the Bible says here carefully, they went out of Nazareth, which was way up uh, by the Sea of Galilee. They're on the southern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And while it's not a long distance by today's standards, Back in those days, that was a long, hard journey for them to take. And Mary was well along in her pregnancy. It was no little thing for them to do this. Try to put yourself in their place. And yet I see here Joseph going ahead and complying with the law. Now I am not one of those who believes that you keep the laws you like and you tell others to keep the laws that you don't like. I believe that Christians ought to be the best law-abiding citizens if possible. Now, if the government passes a law telling me, Burkholder, you can't preach the Bible anymore, that's a law I'm going to break. Because we ought to obey God rather than men. However, I am going to say this. I think that Christians could have a better testimony if they'll go ahead and try to comply, even though they don't like a lot of laws of the land, even though they would be better at writing the laws than others and... Sometimes I even begin to wonder if children could do better than Congress does in this day and age that we live in. But I want to say this. Unless it's asking you to go against God Almighty, it is wise for Christians to be the best citizens they can be. Realizing that our citizenship is in heaven, we first of all are citizens of heaven, right? Right? then we're citizens of the country and so on and I think that it is right to try to comply with the law and I see that in Joseph at this particular time and then quickly please in chapter number 22 another thing about Mary and Joseph in uh, chapter number 2 and verse number 22 when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished they who's they why, Joseph and Mary, they brought him to Jerusalem to what? Present him to the Lord. In other words, I find that this home, again, you have to look a little bit further than this, and our time forbids us doing it, but I find that this home was a Christian home that tried to follow the things of the Lord. I think they prayed before they ate their meals. I think that they tried to attend church regularly. I think they tried to do the best they knew how for the Lord. I don't think they made excuses for themselves and tried to cut some slack. I think that this was a home, these were the kind of people who would sacrifice if need be to try to do what they felt the Lord would have them to do. In verse number 22, when the days of our purification were accomplished, which in her case have been uh, several days, they brought him to the temple to present him to the Lord. Now, there's one for fathers in our day that we live in. What you want to do, and if I can follow on the Sunday school lesson a little bit just this morning, which is a masterful lesson. If you missed it, be sure to get it on the internet or on our church website. Uh, but what I want to say is this. There's not a dad in this room who is um, infallible in rearing children. Or mother, for that matter of fact. They brought him and presented him to the Lord. I remember when our son Paul was born, way before he was born, I think I prayed every day, I was a little bit scared in a way uh, because uh, I wanted the Lord to rear Paul. 
Ah, don't misunderstand me. I did not mean to abdicate my job as the dad, even though his mother um, was around there. And I know what's going through her mind right now because, as I've told you before, uh, I admit I was not a good disciplinarian. And, and uh, Paul, when he was just a little tight, was fooling with something on the coffee table. Now, Marcia did not kid-proof the house. She house-proofed the kid. <laughs> I better be careful. I'm, I'm Marcia and I house-proofed <laughs> the kid. But I, notwithstanding the fact that one time, as a little tyke, he was sitting on the sofa and I was there and, and he knew he was not supposed to fool with certain stuff. I mean just as a little tyke. Marcia never put stuff up from him. She taught him to leave stuff alone that he had no business fooling with. And uh, he put his little hand out like he was going to get that. And then he looked up at me. I was watching him. I at least watched him. And uh, he put his little hand out and he looked up at me and grinned. And I kind of went. He put his hand back. A few seconds later, he put his little hand out, looked up at me and grinned. And he took a hold of it that time. And I told him he better not do that. He put his hand back. I think it's about the third time um, he put his hand out. And I, he took a hold of that, and I told him, I said, Say, if you don't stop fooling with that, I'm going to tell your mother. <laughs> the bad thing was, I didn't realize it, but his mother was coming through the door just right at that time and heard what I said. And she will never let me forget that, no matter what. But be that as it may, I think that we have a man here who, who uh, Joseph was just not going to leave it to the woman to take care of the kid. Joseph was not going to leave it to the woman to rear the kid. And I got to tell you this in my defense. Before Paul was ever born, I prayed daily that the Lord would rear Paul. And I, and I mean this honestly. I hope it comes across right. I was a little worried about my capacities to correctly rear a child. I mean, I had been in the ministry a long time and without a child knew how children ought to be reared. And I well knew how other people needed to rear their kids. But when you get one of your own, all of a sudden it comes home to you, oh my goodness. And after Paul was born, day by day, I would pray that the Lord would help me be a, a good dad. And I would pray that, Lord, where I mess up, would you please straighten it out for me in your mercy and truth. And, well, it must have worked pretty good anyway, because Paul's turned out uh, uh, a young man, uh, well, I guess a middle-aged man now at this time, of whom I am very proud. But I want to say this, that when they brought him up, to the house of the Lord, to present him to the Lord, they were compliant with the law. And then, in verse number 33, after uh, uh, Simeon and after the uh, lady came in, uh, who uh, Anna the prophetess came in and they had these blessings on him, uh, the Bible interestingly tells us in verse number 33, that Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. In other words, that word marveled tells us that they were rejoicing in what was spoken of him. Now, what was spoken of him? Well, just this, that he was going to be of the Lord. I know this is getting a little secular, but I want to say it. He was going to walk with the Lord. Well, he was the Lord. He was going to be of God. He was going to do the things of God. He was going to do the work of God. Now, I want to tell you this, that as a dad, I, uh, 
I think all of us, I can speak for all dads and all mothers, I think we're all proud of the accomplishments that our kids make uh, in this world. Uh, but the one thing I wanted for Paul more than anything else was for him to live for the Lord. No matter what, I wanted him to come to Jesus Christ as his Savior and walk with the Lord. I got to tell you in closing, parents, the most important thing you can do, mother or dad, for your children is to present them to the Lord and pray that they get saved at a young age. Because after it's all said and done, there's only going to be one thing that matters. And that's where your child spends eternity. Second, how your child lives his life here. Is it going to be for God or no? Now to me, Joseph was one of those guys who was going to try to be the kind of role model stepfather the best he could for his children. I said children. Yes, because they did have other children after Jesus was born. I think Joseph was just one of those men. I don't know about you men here this morning, but I would hope you'd want to be one of those kind of men too. I trust that as you've studied this with me a little bit this morning, you might consider, first of all, you're not going to be able to lead your children to the Lord if you're not saved yourself. That's how I feel about it. Second, you're going to have to try every day to be the man God wants you to be if you're going to be able to influence your kids for Christ. Let us stand, please, with our heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and not saved, I'd like to invite you to come Meet me down here at the front. I can have a counselor come show you out of the Bible how to be saved, or you can take a position over here at the door to my right, and a counselor will come to you and show you out of the Bible and the inquiry room how to be saved. Perhaps you're here and you are saved, but you sense your need of the Lord's guidance and help in your being the head of your home, in your being the father at your house. I invite you to come to the altar and pray. If you want to pray with me, you want me to pray with you, come to me personally. God bless you to know and do his will today. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for the time that we've had in thy house. I thank you, O oh God, that we're able to be here with thy word and have thy presence here. And I pray, O oh God, that you might lead us this day in a wonderful way to seek thee and to try to be the man, the men that thou wouldst have us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. As we sing number 159 in the hymnal, as our brother leads.